Welcome everyone to another episode of Financial 15. Kevin and I are ready to go. Today we're talking cottage succession. That's a very big topic. We're going to cover a couple of quick tips to help out with your cottage succession. You want to stick around. Yeah, we're going to scratch the surface on cottage succession planning today. But again, if you want to find out more information, please go to our website at beckerar.com. You can look at our YouTube channel for this or any other articles that we put out on our YouTube channel or also like us on Facebook. That's another place you can find us anytime you want. So to start it off, Clint, quick tips on cottage succession planning. What is the first thing we need to know about this? Yeah, the starting point before we get into the details of the tax or how to handle it, it always has to start with a family discussion. What are the goals? So what do you and your partner want? Uh, what do your kids want? And there's lots of options there. So you want to go through some of the common questions. You can see them on the slide on the screen. Perhaps you have three children. Do all three of them want the cottage? Uh, if only one of them wants the cottage, can they afford to maintain it? What do you do for the other two uh, in terms of your estate? So lots of details there. And uh, I'll simply highlight one that's in the middle. It says, is fair the same as equal? And that gets the, uh, the equation I just mentioned earlier. If you have three kids, one of them wants the cottage, the other two don't. Well, you're going to have to figure something out there. An important point, bottom of the slide, you got to make sure whatever your wishes are, you have to make sure it's fully reflected in your legal documents. You want to make sure that will is up to date. So that's the starting point, Kevin. I know I did that quickly, but we always got to start with that family discussion. And then once that has uh, taken place, you got to get into the nitty gritty. And what are people really worried about here when it comes to the cottage? Yes, it's the capital gains tax. And that's basically the biggest thing that we have to worry about. Because typically, if you have a cottage, you, you, you normally have a principal residence and a cottage. But this is where we need to get to figuring out what the capital gains tax is. And capital gains tax is basically, what are you selling it for compared to what your adjusted cost base is? The difference in between there, that is a taxable entity. And the government wants their share of the money out of that. So that's one of the biggest things that we have to take a look at is figuring out the capital gains tax. As we can see in the example we've got listed here, if we have an adjusted cost base at 100, current fair market value is 500, we've got a $400,000 capital gain. So basically what you're doing is you're showing the government 50% of that, or 200,000, if you're in the highest tax bracket, as we show here, you're looking at 100,000, just over $100,000 for a capital gain if you pass away. That capital gain is automatically triggered and it must be paid. So this is one of the big points that you really have to figure out after that family discussion is, how are we gonna deal with that? Going from here, we're gonna be looking at sort of three tips to try and look at those sort of things. What's the first one we wanna start off with? Uh, absolutely. Three tips trying to tackle that cottage tax bill. How do we reduce the tax? We'll get into the very first tip here for you here, Kevin. The first tip has to do with that formula. It has to do with the adjusted cost base, what they call the ACB. And that capital gains formula, the fair market value, so whatever it's sold at or the value when you pass away, that minus the ACB gives you the capital gain. So if you have a larger cost base, that means you have a smaller capital gain, you pay less tax. So how do you increase that ACB, well, the ACB is made up of your purchase price, so whatever you paid for it, plus yep. any qualified renovations. Now that needs a bit of a definition, qualified renovation. You can see there's a difference here between maintenance expenses, Kevin, and what we call improvement. How would you define the two? Right. Well, yeah, basically, I mean, maintenance would be the same things that you have normally on your house. If you have to keep up or paint the home, something along those lines, you're paying to get it painted, whatever the case may be. Or if you've had it for 20 years and you replace the roof, these are basic maintenance things that have to be done to keep the upkeep of the cottage going. This is not added to your ACB. But if you decide to add a deck or you put a dock on somewhere down the line and you pay money for that, or you upgrade and put a sunroom, something along those lines to add, to improve to what you've got, these are capital expenses that are improvements. They mm -hmm. do count towards your asset base. And again, as you've mentioned before, the most important thing that you need, keep the receipts for everything you do. <laughs> because if you don't, you can say, I did this and this and this. Government's going to come back and go prove it. And if you can't prove it, well, <laughs> they're going to say, no, we're not allowing that to go to your ACB. So yeah, it is definitely figuring out what the difference between maintenance and improvements are, because I've had that question about roofing, I don't know how many times. And basically, a lot of people want to write it off, but it is a maintenance issue. So that's tip number one. What are we talking about when we start getting to tip number two? Yeah, and we'll get into tip number two, but to build on that quickly, Kevin, uh, yes. chat with your accountant, right? If you're not sure is this Very maintenance much. or improvement, that's a good person to ask as your accountant, because they'll probably have a better idea and you don't want to try to clean something and then CRA says no and you get a whole host of issues there. But if you are making capital expenses, you're improving the property, 
keep the receipts. That'll boost your ACB, lower your overall tax bill. Tip number two, and this gets into a big one, but the principal residence exemption. We could do a whole video just trying to explain this <laughs> exemption because it can yes. be quite detailed. We'll just hit the, the highlights here. But the basic idea is as a couple, uh, so it's not per person, per couple, uh, right. you get one residence, one principal residence that is essentially exempt from tax. You can sell it without any capital gain, no tax consequence. And you get to pick what residence that is. Is it going to be the house? Is it going to be the cottage? Maybe you have a condo down south. You can pick whichever residence you want to use as your principal residence exemption. There's a couple criteria listed there. For example, it's normally limited to the building and half a hectare of land. So if you're a farmer and have a lot of land, well, there could be some limitations on the principal residence exemption. And then I'll note the formula. They look at the years of ownership and then how many years it's designated as principal residence. They do add a plus one and I'll explain why. So they give you a bonus here. They give you a year of transition between the, uh, the two properties if you did sell one and keep the other. But we're going to zoom all this in specifically for cottage property. Let's go through an example here, Kevin. Let's say you've got a house in the city yeah. plus you have a cottage and you decide, you know what, the cottage has the bigger gain. So there's more potential tax. That's the one we're going to use tax-free. How does that work? Yeah, again, basically what we're seeing here, as you can see, just based on the numbers that are there, the fair market value, you got a gain of $200,000 on the city home over 16 years. You got a gain of $300,000 over 10 years on the cottage. Now, you can split this up however you want. But for example purposes, you're going to want to maintain as much of that cottage as you can for it. So let's assume that you have the first six years you're living in the home. That's your principal residence. And then the last 10 is going to be your cottage going from there. This is important to, to understand because that way you're covering the entire gain of the $300,000. But you're going to have to pay a portion of tax on that $200,000 for the other 10 years that you are not listing it as your principal residence. So making that clarification is definitely something that we have to look mm -hmm. at. What mm -hmm. kind of stages are we walking ourselves through to get to that number? You mentioned the six years or you mentioned the time of ownership plus one year. So if we take That's a look right. at the city home, what do yeah, we got? So you get a bit of a bonus there and you got all the details here on the slide on the screen. But uh, your key point you, you touched on there, it's a year by year exemption. So in this mm -hmm. case, in this example, we had the city home. We're saying the first six years, city home is a principal residence. Then we bought a cottage in 2011. That point forward, cottage is principal residence. You're allowed to break it up that way. So whenever we sell the house, the first six years are listed as the principal residence, but you get that plus one. So you actually get seven years tax-free. In this example, we own the city home for a total of 16 years. We get seven tax-free, so we get 43.75% of whatever the capital gain is. We're getting 43% of it exempt, tax-free. And you can see the rest of the calculation are going into the capital gain. But the idea here is we get a portion of the city home tax-free and then the entire cottage completely tax-free. So we're getting the most out of our principal residence exemption here. So tip number two, how do you save tax on the cottage? You, you, you get quite strategic with your principal residence exemption. It could be one way to really reduce or completely eliminate that tax bill when it comes to the cottage. Let's get into tip number three here, Kevin. This one's a little more complicated. It gets into a capital gains reserve or what some people call a promissory note. Yeah, I mean, basically what you're doing here is you're giving the cottage away early or you're selling it to your child or whoever's yeah. buying it down below. And what you're basically doing is you're saying, you know what, we will sell this to you. And as opposed to you paying everything up front now, we're going to give up, you're, you're going to give us a promissory note and then you're going to pay it off when something happens to us. You'll get your inheritance from here. The inheritance will pay off the promissory note and you get it that way. But you do have to set it up in a way so that it is a loan document, a proper loan document. Because if not, they may look at this as something different. And that way, you know, it, whether it's an interest-free promissory note, whether you set a 1% interest rate on it or whatever the case may be, you need to know that it's got to be a legal document that's put together for the family property concerns. This allows you to get that when it comes due, and that way you deal with some of the capital gains reserves and yeah. stuff along that line. What else on this point should we emphasize? Yeah, quickly on that last slide there, some folks make the loan forgivable upon death, so they set it up so that they're selling it to their kids uh, while they're still alive. The kids pay it off over time as a loan, but when they pass away, the loan's forgiven. Uh, you can do that. Often what folks do is they, they do it this way so they can split up that capital gains tax bill. So instead of getting the capital gains bill in one year as a lump sum, you sell it all in 2021. So you have a capital gains in 2021. You could use this promissory note of that capital gains reserve up to five years. So you could end up with splitting the bill instead of one year, 
Maybe you get it over five years, so it reduces the overall tax burden. It's not a, a foolproof strategy. You can see there's a few items noted on the slide there. That does mean your income could be elevated for a number of years instead of one year. For example, it could be elevated for five years, which yes. could incur some other issues. For example, the OAS clawback and other income tested benefits could become a problem if you do it that way. So there's no line in the sand here, no perfect item that says, oh, we just do this and suddenly the cottage tax bill disappears. We give you three tips, three ideas, but this is just the the the, the most tip of the iceberg when it comes to cottage succession. We didn't even yes. talk about, do you put the, the child on the title early? Uh, what happens if you pass away and we put it into a corporation? There's a whole bunch of different ideas, different ways you can tackle this. We did a full webinar, an hour long webinar, where we went into detail about all those different items. And you can find that uh, on our YouTube page for free. Uh, and you can watch it uh, on that page. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is just scratching, as you mentioned, the tip of the iceberg for any of these things. We mentioned three different points that go on. Again, I mean, some of the options that we can take a look at, if you're worried about maintenance, whether it's maintenance or it's improvement, you know, CRA is a place to consult. If you're dealing with a couple, remember, it's a couple, you can't each claim a principal residence. It's couples that claim it. And I've had people ask me before, well, if I sell my home today, can I claim all that? And then I can move right to the cottage and I can claim all that later. No, as we showed in the example, you do have to pay a capital gains tax depending on which issue you've had. So these are just basic scratching points. Again, as Clint stressed, the webinar is the place to go. Our YouTube channel, find it off of our website. You'll get great information off of it from there. Other than that, I don't think that there's anything else we can add on cottage succession planning at this time without going in depth. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I, I think we covered three quick tips there. Uh, I'll put the link in the description for that webinar if you do want the full hour long version with all the details, you can find it there. And if you have other questions, whether it's on cottage succession or any other topic we've tackled, simply visit us, chatwithclintonkevin.com. We'd love to hear from you, love to help out. You can find us at chatwithclintonkevin.com. So I think that's it for today. We'll say uh, everyone take care, stay safe. We'll be back again next week with another video.